want to talk about uh, the sorts of robots we're building, and I've deployed thousands of them in factories around the world. Um, this is our second robot, Sawyer. Um, first one was called Baxter. Um, and uh, Sawyer is a robot that uh, we're putting into the 90% of factories that don't have robots currently. Um, and importantly, Sawyer is a collaborative robot so that people can be close to the robot and we don't have to cage it off. And over time, we've looked at problem after problem that robot, putting robots into new parts of factories, new factories have, and we've tried to knock each one down. So the first was to go cage-free. Um, the second was to um, provide a way of training the robot that you didn't need to be a programmer, you didn't need to you know, interface with those old programming systems that most industrial robots have. Are you, how, how are we doing? Are you close to go? Okay, so let me explain what we're going to see here. This is our new version of our software uh, in Terra 5. Um, we've got a laptop up there, and we're looking at inside the brain of the robot for the moment. Um, so it's got a full model of, uh, w w of, of what's going on. In fact, if I... Oh, you'll see it, yeah. So as, as, as the robot moves, um, and as anything moves, it all, it all matches up there. And so let, let's just start it. We rolled it out. It doesn't know where things are. So the first thing it's going to do, and uh, actually, can you just make sure the camera view is up on the screen before you start? Um, we have built-in force sensing, and we have built-in cameras. Uh, there's a camera on here, and it's going to look for a fiducial marker. And as it, are you ready to start? Yeah. As it starts, you'll see where it thinks the array of parts is, those purple dots. Um, see, nothing could go wrong, right? We're going to start. He's about to start up. Oh, confirm, delete node. Sorry, press the wrong button. OK. <laughs> um, OK. So now you see those, those purple, um, that purple array there. Uh, and you can see the view from the camera up there. It's looking at a fiducial marker, and it just rearranged those purple nodes to the actual coordinate system of the array of parts. And if we could, yeah, so you can see there that it's going after each of those parts, dropping them in. And um, it's going to, after the first row, we've just set up that it's going to re-register uh, where things are. You wouldn't normally need to do that, but I'm going I'm I'm to move it after the, uh, after the the fifth part there, I'm just going to rotate it a bit. It's going to come back now, re-register. You'll see the purple nodes there shift after it figures out exactly where they are. So everything's generated dynamically. And the robot has got force sensing on every joint, so it's, it's safe to be quite close to it. And as you know, many of you, you wouldn't try that with a conventional industrial robot. Things would not have gone as well as they did if you did that. So, the robot is safe to interact with, safe to be close to. Um, but now I want to show you, and let's, let's stop that. I want to show you, um, this is uh, Tom Miller here. Tom is now going to be a factory worker. And he is just going to come up to the robot. He's not going to use this second screen, although we'll still see inside the, the, the head of the robot. Can we just, uh, yeah. So he's going to start up and say, I'm going to train a new task for the robot. And um, up, on this, up on the head screen, he's going to, going to interact. It's just created a little program, that tree there, and now he's going to grab the end of the robot, and when he grabs it, it goes into zero-force gravity compensated mode, so it's trying to accommodate and apply zero-force to his fingers as he moves it around. Now, he's going to bring it down over this part, and as he brings it down, he, he, we're just going to have a fixed location for it. He's going to press a button which closes the fingers. Now, as he closes the fingers, he's going to say, this is a basic pickup. It said, this must be a pickup. And you see it built a bigger part of the tree there. And this is the program that it's generating automatically. He doesn't have to know that. Tom, you know, he doesn't even have a high school diploma uh, in, this, in this little play. He doesn't know about behavior trees. He doesn't know about internal stuff. He's just looking at the screen here. And now he's going to say, OK, let's move it over to here. And he's going to say, OK, 
presses the, the button to open the fingers, and it's going to say up on the screen, if you can see that, what sort of, what sort of uh, put down location is it? And he's going to say, OK, this is going to be a pattern. You can't quite see the screen, unfortunately. But um, it's now said, OK, if it's a pattern, you need to tell me the four corners of the pattern. You can just see that on the head screen here. So he's going to move it around, um, make a selection, and he's going to now show the four corners. Thanks for zooming in. That's great. Um, and uh, he's going to show the four corners of the pattern. Second corner, third corner, and now the fourth corner. And now, um, if we can zoom, come back to the screen here with the camera, as you had a second ago, um, he's going to have to tell it. And I can't quite see whether we can get that. So you can see that better. Oh, it, it says, is this a 5 by 5 pattern? And he's going to say, no, it's really a 3 by 5 pattern, just defaulted to, to 5 by 5. And so there's a little wizard in there. We've got lots of wizards for different sorts of aspects of programming. Just, just finish it up, if you can. So 355, he's going to say what direction to fill it. It's leading him through it. Some of you here have a smartphone, right? Did any of you go to a, a, a did any of you have to take a, a community college course on how to use it? That's what we're trying to do here. You don't have to be trained. The robot leads you through what you need to know, what Tom needs to know in order to affect it. And now he can just run that simple program. So he, he just, in this case, just had a fixed location for pickup. And now you see the, the tree here that it developed. This is the program that it, it wrote having watched what he did, and it's executing this tree. The green node is where it is currently in the program, and it's going to fill that array, that 3 by 5 array. So let's, uh, let's stop that now, and let's uh, switch over and sh give a force demo. And I need a volunteer. Would you mind coming up? Because <laughs> uh, can, you, can you get up there OK? OK. So, um, what Tom is going to do is he's running a, a program that he set up before, and he's going to go back. Now, now, Tom is, now Tom is an engineer. He's no longer, uh, he's no longer a, 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 a factory worker. So can you just get into the mode? Yep, yep, sure. OK. So now what, what this has done, you can see over there the green node. It's applying, what is it, 20 newtons? It's come up here. And just lift that up. OK, and let it go. So it's, it's going to zero. Push it down. So it's applying 20 newtons of force as you go. Now, uh, Tom is going to stop the program, open up the node, and you'll see in there um, that you can control compliance in every direction in six axis. You can control it in any frame of reference. Happens to be using the frame of reference of this, this um, wrist at the moment, but it could be an arbitrary frame of reference. Change it to, say, 40 newtons. Or what, what, was it 20 originally? It was 20 newtons. Yeah. OK. So now we're going to run it again. And you are going to tell the audience how it feels different. <laughs> it, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go through the start. Push up. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do this. This is just a, to switch it. In, it this program actually does a couple of things. OK, so now, oh gosh. <laughs> so 40 newtons is more than 20 newtons is, is, the, is, the, is the, uh, the, the thing here. Uh, actually, can we switch it? Do I twist to? Yep, twist. And down to do the other mode? Yes. And now this is? OK, so yeah, so actually, you, you can grab, just grab that. You can see that it's compliant this way. But if you try and move it sideways, it's applying a force to you. Anyway, thank you so much for that. Um, so the point here is that we get to control forces in arbitrary axes. We've got cameras on the robot. And, and I think I'm going to end the demo now. Thanks, Tom. Uh, and uh, let me uh, now go to my, uh, my uh, presentation slides, if I can. This is the way Sawyer operates in real life. Um, here it is uh, doing a little machine tending task. It's putting a couple, of, this, was, this was trained by uh, a customer. It's putting a couple of pieces of metal in there using force to feel where they are, uh, 
took two in at once so it didn't have to go and do two, two reaches. Um, this particular machine only operates when the door is closed, so the robot goes and closes the door. Notice its eyes, it's glancing where it's about to reach so it doesn't surprise people around it. Um, closing the two doors because that's the safety interlock rather than have to have a PLC or something else, just uses the same interface that the human uses and then go, goes press the go button. And with the camera that is built into the head, we can see and look at the, the green lights come on, the red lights come on, et cetera, and interact with the machine. But it used force there. And um, by sensing force and predicting what the force is going to be, it's safe to have the robots close with people. You know, again, you would not want to do this with a conventional industrial robot. Turn your back on it. You'd want to have a cage. Um, but the way we measure forces is in, and this is the older robot, Baxter, in each joint we are measuring the force. And so you'll see with something called series elastic actuators. So you'll see here as we're applying a force to the end, you'll see that on the seven axes, the force that it's sensing in each axis. And the ones that are bearing load are bigger, the twist ones are smaller, but it's measuring forces in those seven axes, then puts them through the, an inverse Jacobian and gets the resultant force at any point on the robot. So we can tell what the forces are. Our forward model then is predicting what's going to happen. So when we're in the way of it and it hits us, it knows that. When, by the way, um, you get hit by it, you can push it away and it senses that extra force. But that lets us do a different sort of, of, of uh, parts uh, placement. Here, we've got a plastic piece and a well, which is just precisely the size of that plastic piece. And what we're going to see here is repeatedly, someone is going to put this plastic piece in a different location. The robot's going to pick it up blind. It's not going to know where it is in its hand. But just as a person would do, it uses force sensing to slide against the edge, slide to the other end, and feel it seat in. Now, this time, it's going to pick it up at a very different part, a very different location on that part. But again, it's able to get um, very uh, precise location at the end because it's using force mating, which is what people do. People don't use position control. People use force control when they're assembling parts. Um, here, here it is in a, a uh, putting, putting parts, pieces of metal into a, a, pre, a press brake, not knowing exactly where this was rolled up to next to the press brake. So it's picking it up with maybe within five centimeters, but it pushes against the stops in that press brake. This is actually in a steel case factory in Alabama, by the way. And there's someone over there who also does this job, and he's missing fingers. Um, this is, the, this is uh, Sawyer putting a, uh, a, a dim into a circuit board. And you can see that we can measure all the forces as they're happening, um, putting the corner in first, as a person would, and then sliding it in. And we now get some sort of IoT-like uh, um, data on how much force was applied, which can be then be sent up to the cloud so we know everything that happened. Um, here it's uh, clicking in the, uh, clicking in the, uh, the uh, dim at the end and seeing if the right level of force for the click happens. So we can collect all that data, get that sent off to whatever uh, um, ERP or MES system that we, we happen to be using. Here's a, an inspection task. This is uh, going to pull on this cable to see whether the cable has been installed correctly. And you'll see, yeah, it's installed. The force uh, is, is the right sort of level. Uh, but this next time, it's going to be when the cable isn't installed correctly. It's going to pull it. Ah, not enough force there. So we're using force inspection. Um, now we're going to. Um, uh, use, use the uh, camera in the wrist of the robot. We've also got a camera in the head. Oh, uh, maybe that's the next video. And it's going to be doing visual inspection of, of, of this particular engine, a water pump. Um, so it's going over, making sure everything's installed. And you can imagine people doing this task. They last about 20 minutes before their error rate goes through the roof of doing, because you know, some, some of these sort of inspection tasks is 50 steps. Here, it's, it's going to sense. Uh, where the switch is in the right position, it's a fail. It's going to go and fix it, because uh, that's something that it can fix pretty easily in this case. 
So we see vision, we see force being used intrinsic to the robot. And that's, for me, a key capability of, of, um, of a collaborative robot. It's that it's not just safe to be around, but it, that it uses and does tasks in ways similar to people. This, I'm just going to let this run. This is a, a, a factory in China um, with a b whole bunch of Soyuz. And, and interestingly, and we see this all the time, even our smallest customers, less than, a, less than a dozen people in them, we see lots of customers with 3D printers, and they do the 3D printing of the fingers, and they do the 3D printing of, of fixtures. So we're seeing low-cost 3D printers in lots of factories all over the world. Now, I want to I say a little more. Because of using force sensing, you can't just take an existing industrial robot and turn it into a collaborative robot. You have to be able to sense forces. And it's not just endpoint sensing, it's the whole sensing on the whole robot. Another thing that we're seeing, we always look for what the friction is for our customers. Another thing we see is that our customers hate PLCs. PLCs, to many of our customers, they haven't had automation before, they've never had to use PLCs. The last thing we need to do is say, First, figure out how to use PLCs, and then you can have our robot talk to your other equipment. So what we've done now in the version of software that we're showing you here is we've got a lot of the PLC logic in the same behavior tree, in the same sort of, uh, of control teach by demonstration that we've got for the robot. And so these people who've never had PLCs before don't have to know about PLCs. I tell companies like Siemens, you know that, that PLCs are dead. It's just a matter of time before they go away. They deserve to die. PLCs deserve to die, even though they were invented in Bedford, Massachusetts here. Programmable logic controllers. I see someone asking, what's a PLC? Programmable logic controller. It was the replacement for electromagnetic relays developed in 1968. But the key abstraction inside a PLC is the coil. They're still emulating electromagnetic relays. It's time for that to end. So bringing more software into the robot that can interact with other machines makes for now, for places that have never had automation before, makes the robot the controller of a whole cell, not just of the robot, but of the cell. And we're measuring forces. We're, we're re reading um, uh, barcodes on pieces. We're sending that to the cloud. So we've got a little bit of IoT happening in the, in the robot. If we look at the IoT strategies that some of the big companies, the German companies, are pushing, it's very much a top-down strategy. First, invest $5 million and put stuff everywhere. Then you'll get data. Our customers don't want to invest a lot of money. They want value right away. So we're giving them IoT capabilities with the robot, which they want the robot anyway. They've got a, an ROI calculation on the robot. But we're feeding them some IoT capabilities starting to collect that data and starting to see what they can do with that. But it's incremental value without a top-down, high capital cost investment. So I'm real excited about, obviously, I've spent eight years with this company, building this company. I'm real excited about how we can change manufacturing, how we can digitalize manufacturing by providing real value in terms of um, repetitive work replacement at a low, with a low-cost robot but start to get some of the impact that we all see off in the future for digitalization with that initial entry into the factories. Because the vast majority of factories in, in the world are very, very low tech. I make a joke that our mission at my company is to drag manufacturers into the late 20th century. That's what we want to do. So thank you very much. I, I thought I only had 20 minutes, but I see I've got some more time. I'll, I'll take questions, and the, although people probably want to leave, but I'll take, take, take a few questions and I'll let you get away. Questions? Anyone? Yes, back there. Here comes a microphone behind you. So collaborative robotics and, and applications are a really fascinating uh, subject. The, the problem that we've experienced, and, and I'm coming from Ontario, Canada, where uh, we put the cart before the horse, so to speak. 
uh, it's legislated that we do a pre-start review so that we're in adherence to ANSI and ISO standards for safety. And we're an automotive manufacturer, so we you're a, you're a we're an automotive parts manufacturer, precision machine components, not unlike some of the applications you showed here. We make sharp things. So ANSI, ISO, CSA say I have to do a risk assessment before I can do a collaborative or any robot. Any company. robot, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. The risk assessment drives me to the same safety measures, whether I'm using um, a collaborative robot or a conventional industrial robot because I've got sharp corners on my part. How do we get around this and make collaborative applications more prevalent? Yeah, I think, I think for some cases like that, it's just going to have to be a while until we get an acceptance through other methods. I used to say, um, uh, don't give the robot a knife. Um, because of exactly that risk assessment. And then we were, selling, we were selling research versions of the robots, and the first one we sold was to Cornell University, and the first thing they did was gave it a knife and was showing they could avoid people. Um, so uh, I, I feel your pain. Um, uh, I, I, think, I think for some sorts of applications where there are not sharp objects, those risk assessments work fine. Um, uh, and I think we're just going to have to be patient for the ones where there are until there's a comfort level. Um, we can't expect everyone to change and all the legislation to change all at once. It's got to be through a series of steps over, over many years for some of the applications. So um, we, when we go in, when, we, when, we're, when we're talking to a customer, we walk the floor with them and we say, let's not do that application. Let's do this other application because of what we think can get through those risk assessments in, in the short term. And of course, it does vary by country, too, um, on, on what is required. But we're doing great in, in Germany, for instance. Germany's a fantastic customer for us. And there, as you would expect, Germany has very strict uh, risk assessment standards. But it, it doesn't mean that there aren't lots of applications, just not all applications. Patience, patience, patience. Yeah, back there. Yeah, hi. With uh, Baxter and Sawyer, we've uh, always had the question about uh, speed, about the velocity of the robot. Can we speed it up and still make it uh, safe? Yeah, so um, uh, Sawyer is faster than Baxter, but it does have, um, um, for the European standards, uh, you can actually turn down the voltage and voltage limit it for some, of the, for some of those exact safety standards that were referenced over there. Um, if, you, if you're prepared to have a cage, then you, know, you can run full speed. Um, uh, I think we are getting acceptance that it is safe. When we were at Automate four years ago, uh, the first time we showed Baxter, we had to go uh, to their safety people and show the robot smashing us all in the chest um, before they said you can have an, well, this time, first uncaged robot. If you were at Automate a few weeks ago, you would have seen hundreds of uncaged robots. It's now become normal at trade shows. So acceptance will come. Not all robots that are claiming to be collaborative and are sort of rebranded position control robots, not all are safe because they may only have a, a load cell at the end for force sensing. That's not safe if you get hit, hit, hit here. Um, and also the, the safety threshold. So another collaborative robot that's out there that we often see uh, out, has a 150 Newton threshold. I would not put my head in front of a, a robot with a 150 Newton threshold. Our threshold is, uh, we can sense down to one Newton. Our threshold is more like 10 Newtons. So um, it, it varies by what level of fidelity of force sensing people have, I think. Um, uh, we will see faster robots. We will see faster collaborative robots as people have better force sensing. What's the lifting capacity, and it can still remain collaborative? What's, that, uh, what's the limit? It, uh, well, um, it, it, it's a, it's a, it, is, it does get down to these risk assessments. It's a, it's a function of velocity, and you know, there's a certain, there's a certain uh, inertia. You, know, you can't argue with physics at some point. Um, we, on this current robot, we uh, have uh, a four kilogram payload. 
we'll double that in the, in the future. And, 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 but if you want to put a 50 kilogram payload on a, on a robot and, you know, with a, a three meter reach and move it around, it's not going to be collaborative from only force sensing. It's just not going to happen. Um, you're going to have to have some other sort of safety system detecting it from the outside. So I, I, think, I think we're limited probably to 10 kilogram payloads for collaborative robots that do not have some sort of external vision, 3D sensing uh, safety system that are purely force-based, such as this one. By the way, this, this, this arm is so much lighter than the original Baxter arm because that gets rid of a lot of inertia, too. Any other questions, or do you all want to go have fun? Okay, I don't know whether anyone's going to come out and say goodnight, but thank you very much for your time. <laughs>